Welcome, everybody. We're just letting the room fill up before we get started. Thank you for joining us. Giving it one more minute in case there's any latecomers. Okay. Keep an eye on the room and let anyone else in. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's very special event with Joel Hockman and Sue, Sue Schmetting, who will be speaking on the powerful impact of family research into the Holocaust and what the impact um, of this has been on their lives. My name is Christine Schmidt, and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Research at the Wiener Holocaust Library. And I wanted to thank you all for joining us for the first of a new event series um, we've called Excavation, Confrontation and Repair, Family Histories of the Holocaust. Now this series derives from a dedicated service that we offer at the Wiener Holocaust Library, which is led by my colleagues, Mary Vrabetz and Elise Bath, from whom you'll also hear this evening to support Holocaust survivors, their families and their descendants in conducting research into the past. Since 2013, the library has operated a full copy of the International Tracing Service Digital Archive, which is housed in its original format in Bad Arlesen, Germany, and which is now called the Arlesen Archives. And there's a considerable number of these documents um, which are now available on the Arlesen Archives website, which I'll put into the chat shortly, um, unless one of my colleagues beats me, beats me to it. However, the library is the only point of access to the entirety of this remarkable digital collection in the UK. And we've also gained considerable expertise in helping people navigate its vast holdings and pointing them to other resources to support their research. The inquiries we receive have ranged from survivors seeking documentation to support insurance or other claims to those who've lived only with the bare outline of what happened to their families during the Holocaust. Others have come to us seeking connections with living relatives and descendants in an attempt to repair the brutal destruction of family ties by the Nazis and their allies during the Holocaust. So tonight we'll hear one such connection made by Joel Hockman and Sue Smetting, who will be in conversation with my colleague, one of the library's senior International Tracing Service archive researchers, Elise Bath. My other colleague, Mary Roberts, who is also a senior ITS archive researcher, will be helping to field questions after their formal remarks. So um, we, we actually invite you to keep an eye out for upcoming events in the series, which will include practical advice on getting started with your own research and the resources we have available to support you at the library. And we're also um, planning on uh, providing writing workshops and other opportunities to get involved, which will be announced in the coming year. We've conceived this series as an opportunity for researchers and families to discuss and reflect on the process and meaning of delving into the past and I'm very much looking forward to tonight's conversation and to your questions. So before I hand over to Elise, just a couple uh, notes of housekeeping. Your microphone is going to be muted for the entirety of the evening. So when you have a question, please feel free to drop it into the chat box um, at the bottom of your screen and we'll be um, happy to take those at any time. Um, we are recording this event and we'll be loading it onto YouTube at a later time, but your screen is not going to be uh, visible on the recording. But we'll, and we'll also be sure to read out uh, your first name only in the Q&A. And finally, we do have automated closed captioning available, um, which you can toggle on or off at the bottom of your screen using the ellipsis and the more uh, feature in Zoom choosing to uh, include subtitling. 
So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Elise. Thanks, Christine. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to this, this evening's event. Thank you very much for being here with us. Um, after Christine's uh, very thorough introduction there, I, I don't want to rehash old ground. Um, and I would like to get on to, to Joel and Sue speaking as soon as possible, because that's sort of the meat of, of this evening's um, event. Um, we've been working at the library with Joel and Sue um, for, for a little while now, on and off. They're being very patient with me um, as I'm sort of trying to do research with them. Um, and I've been deeply impressed by their tenacity, uh, both of them, I have to admit, and by sort of the, the, the wealth of resources that they've independently um, contacted and all the efforts that they've gone to in their own research, which has obviously paid off, has paid dividends for them, as you'll hear shortly. So uh, for the format for the rest of this evening, um, Sue and Joel are both going to speak now and present sort of their um, perspective on the research that they've carried out. And then we're going to open it out into a more broader conversation where we're going to reflect on some of the thematic issues that this sort of family research raises. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sue, first of all. Um, so Sue, if you'd like to unmute yourself and um, start speaking to the group, that would be lovely to hear from you. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, hi. Um, this is really quite surreal, I have to say, not only uh, talking on a, a webinar, but also for the, the Vena Library, but also with the title as family. Um, I'm now at an age, um, so I like to say middle age, um, and I grew up thinking I had no family. Um, what Joel and I thought we'd do is really um, aim towards a certain day. That date for us is the 15th of, of June. So we're going to, both going to give a little bit of a, a, a history as to how do we got to that date. Um, I'm the daughter of uh, Liesel Liechtenstein. Uh, she was on the kinder transport um, from Vienna. She was put on the train. She actually celebrated her seventh birthday on uh, the train from Vienna. Um, she was taken in by a family in Birmingham. Unfortunately, that family um, didn't treat her very well, so she was taken to another family. Um, when she was 14, um, she was taken away from that family, uh, basically because the association or the, the, the Jewish association believed she should have been with a Jewish family and the, the, this particular family that she'd been placed with weren't Jewish. Um, so you can imagine she had quite an unsettled uh, childhood. After a year, um, it didn't work. So she was placed back into a, another family. So I think, it, yeah, the, there's, I know there's a lot of, of books and a, a lot of articles been written about the impacts of the kinder transport. And I would um, recommend if anybody hasn't uh, listened to the podcast, the AJR uh, podcast on the voices I think to understand the, the impact of, of the kinder transport. Um, but basically she, um, yeah, turned her back on her history in a way um, and decided that for, I think probably for her, um, her own purposes to focus on the future. Um, I think the traits that, that kinder transport of many um, of the, this generation had were sort of lack of, lack of identity, um, survival, guilt, um, so she kind of really um, grounded herself in the local community. That was where, where she uh, felt safe and that's what she decided to do. I didn't actually know until I was 13 about her history and that was literally um, an accident. Um, somebody at school had made a comment about someone being really Jewish, being really stingy and my mother actually lost her temper. And, um, and at that stage, I actually had to explain to me why she'd lost her temper quite so. And that's when the history came out. Um, and then it kind of went into a cupboard. It wasn't really discussed anymore over the years. Um, I think she was aware of um, uh, the, the, the situation, the lack of identity. Um, and she did, um, over the years, she did, you know, kind of, we used to say she was a bit of a, a, an ostrich, really. She'd put her head in the sand and sometimes she'd pop up. Um, she joined the Association of Jewish Refugees um, and went to a couple of talks. Um, she would, uh, the um, nearest synagogue was in Maidenhead and she would actually go and visit um, and talk to the rabbi occasionally, but then she'd uh, go back into her shell and, and, and stay there. Um, she had a, a distant relative who had, um, uh, I think she'd come over as a domestic 
Um, she was a lot older. I think it was she was a, a second cousin or a second aunt of my mother's. And um, she tried to keep in contact, but my mother did, didn't uh, uh, yeah, didn't keep up the relationship. But she did have a slight uh, family tree uh, saying of who was uh, had, um, was in her immediate family. Obviously, you know, she was six, seven years old. So she had no idea um, of who, you know, who there was apart from her, her brother who'd been left behind. Um, so she kind of went through her life thinking um, that everybody was dead. Um, then in uh, um, 1988, she, I was actually in Israel at the time. I'd gone um, uh, on a kibbutz and decided to stay. So I was living in Israel. In 1988, she got a letter from um, a, somebody called Kurt Maiman. Uh, Kurt Maiman turned out to be her cousin on her mother's side. Um, and it turns out that he'd actually fled to Shanghai with his family. Um, and he was then in Israel. So I actually went to see him. So I met him. Mum didn't actually meet him. She, um, yeah, whether, whether she couldn't or whether she, we don't know, but she never actually met him. But he did have, uh, we could actually uh, put together a little bit of the family tree. But again, we didn't know what had happened to everybody. Um, and then in uh, about 2013, uh, she made the decision that she wanted to go back to Vienna. Um, so we went to Vienna. Um, suddenly everything became very real to her. She, um, underneath, if anybody here is, is aware that this, in, um, in Vienna, there was one synagogue um, that had survived and all the archives were underneath this synagogue. Um, and they, uh, suddenly she saw everything in black and white. Um, you know, suddenly there were computers and so she could see what had happened to everybody. And she had it uh, in black and white that everybody actually had been uh, murdered. Her father was on the first transport out of Vienna to, uh, on the Nisko transport. That was the first transportation out. Um, her mother and her brother had been sent to Mali Trostinich. Um, her favorite uncle, had been sent to Auschwitz and grandparents on both sides had been sent to Theresienstadt and nobody had survived. Um, going, the, the uncle, that there was a, quite an interesting story. He, she, we couldn't actually find how he'd got, um, how he'd been deported. Um, it wasn't actually registered. All it said is that he'd been uh, murdered in Auschwitz. Um, so I Googled, so this is a, <laughs> I just put his name into Google and suddenly a, a, a museum in France came up and this museum was a stamp museum. And my mother seemed to think that he had fled to Paris. She seemed to, you know, she'd remembered him because he used to give her sweets. Um, he was, she, she used to think he was a confectionery salesman and he used to give her sweets. Um, it turns out actually, when I did some more digging, um, I found this museum. It turns out that he was actually uh, arrested. He had fled to France and he had a, a, a girlfriend who was a, a French woman, a Catholic. Um, and unfortunately he was arrested um, and he was sent uh, to the camp de Nancy. Whilst he was in this camp, she was sending him letters saying how that she was gonna try and uh, get him out of the camp. The last letter that she wrote didn't actually um, get to him. He didn't receive it, he'd already left. So this letter is in a museum in France, in a stamp museum. So that's how we kind of found out his uh, route. So good old Google actually uh, helped on that one. Um, Mum died in 2014. Um, when she died, um, yeah, it had been quite a, a, an emotional roller coaster over the last few years um, of her life. Um, so when she died, I kind of, um, I wouldn't say needed a break, but it, I needed some time to breathe. So I actually uh, gave her um, all her things to the Wiener Library, uh, her suitcase, her Nazi passport, uh, everything that she had, I gave to them. Um, then when my children left home, I decided it was time to uh, do some work for myself and I got the dream job. I, I live, actually live in, uh, in the Netherlands. I got the dream job of working at the Anne Frank house. Um, my job is actually uh, history uh, lessons, really. It's, it's uh, tourists and, and people that want a little bit more history of, uh, of Amsterdam or the Netherlands in the war and how the Frank family uh, got to where they were. Um, so I give the, the, uh, the lessons beforehand. 
So this really opened up my interest to the whole situation and made me realize it was really time to start delving a lot more into my family. And, uh, and I was ready to do it, really. And then came Corona. Um, like I said, when, when Mama died, I'd given everything to the Vina Library, but the, the things that I hadn't given, I'd put into a suitcase. Um, so I decided to open this suitcase. In the suitcase, I found a letter that Kurt from Israel had written to Mum. Um, I'd been in Israel at the time, so I hadn't actually read the letter. Um, and the letter uh, mentioned uh, uh, Uncle Bernard, who'd fled to Shanghai with his uh, children, uh, Freddie and Renee, uh, and then they'd moved to, uh, uh, to the States. I'd never heard of Uncle Bernard, whether um, this sunk in with mum or not, I don't know, but I'd never heard. So this is coincidentally then, this is where the dates come in. Um, during Corona, I'd started listening to lots of different webinars and, uh, and coincidentally there was one, Elise was doing one from the, the on, I think it was the 11th of, of uh, June, Elise, you were doing one with the, uh, about the ITS and, and how the ITS could help. So I listened in on that. Um, the following day, um, I actually wrote to Elise and I said, uh, you know, how do I do this? I seem to have information about the people that had, um, had perished, who'd been murdered in the Holocaust, but it was, I was finding it a lot harder to try and find people that were still alive. How did I do this? And I didn't even think because the side of the family that Bernard was on was actually on um, my mother's grandfather's side. We, all, we knew about the grandmother's side and everybody had died, but we didn't know about the grandfather's side. I didn't, it didn't even come into my head that there could be family out there. Maybe this is where you, um, when you read things, you only take in what you can, you can cope with at the time. Um, so anyway, so Elise wrote me back. Um, so that was on the 12th of June. I went to the supermarket on the 15th of June and suddenly on my Facebook messenger, a little peep uh, came up and I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna read it because it's, you can imagine I'm in the supermarket next to the sprouts. Um, hi Sue, I hope you don't mind me contacting you, but I wondered if we might be related. Lisa Lichtenstein was a cousin of my late grandmother, Melita. If I have the correct relative, I believe Lisa came to Birmingham via the kinder transport and we are related through the Maiman side of the family who were in Vienna, which is where my gran was also born and who also came to the UK. Please let me know if this is correct. I look forward to hearing from you and hope you're keeping well in these strange times. <laughs> so that's how we got to the 15th of June, completely um, out of the blue, not, uh, I hadn't even spoken to Elise at this time. So this is complete coincidence. And I think later I said to Elise that this was a, uh, a bit of a Corona situation. A lot of people were maybe looking into their, uh, their histories, but this uh, came completely out of the blue. Um, and so now I'm gonna pass you over to Joel who is going to give his side of the story of how he got to the 15th of June. So, Joel. Thanks. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Thanks, Sue. Thanks. So, yeah, so my, um, the way I got to the 15th of June is uh, slightly different. So I'll go back a bit and then we'll get to the uh, 15th of June. So, um, Three of my uh, grandparents uh, were Austrian. So Trudy Schlossmann came over in February 1939 and married my grandfather, Nat Hockman, who was English. And Eric Rota, my other grandfather, came over on the 29th of August in 1939. And he was married to my gran, uh, Melissa, who you've heard a little bit about, um, who came over on the 18th of September 1938 from Vienna and was a... Uh, dancer, a ballet dancer in the Vienna State Opera. So uh, I suppose my journey into all of this research really started uh, probably when I was about eight years old or so. And my, my gran read me this book. I don't know if you can see that, but my gran read me this book, A Candle in the Dark, and it was about uh, Chris Dunlough, the Knight of uh, the Broken Glass. So she read it to me and I said, did, did that really happen? I'd never heard about it before until that point. I said, is it real? Did it really happen? And why did it happen? She said, it did happen. It happened because these people were Jewish, but it wasn't their fault. And that made me start asking lots of different questions. Um, and from there, I started to look at old family photos um, and I saw the different faces in all of the families. And at that time, so probably about, I'd say about 15 years or so ago, I started to write up 
all of this information on a computer back then, a big old PC with uh, less, uh, less programs compared to what we have today. Um, and it was really from there that my interest developed and I went to live in Germany for a little bit. And when I was in Germany, um, I was living in Berlin and they just opened the memorial to the murdered Jews in Europe. And my grand came to visit me. She was already, I'd say in her eighties, already in her eighties. And there was an option to search for relatives there. And we found the Yad Vashem documents that people uh, submitted uh, after the Second World War when they were looking for their family members who'd uh, disappeared or perished. And um, we, saw those, we saw those documents. So that was quite emotional because I think she hadn't seen those documents for many, many years. And from there that um, made me want to continue my research. And I then contacted Bad Arolsen, the archives and uh, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And that's kind of the journey with all the different organizations to begin with. And then my grand had always been a member of the Association of the Jewish Refugees. And there was an event at the uh, Wiener Library. So um, we went along, I'm not sure she came, but we went along and uh, we met Christine and uh, we did a bit of uh, research afterwards with Christine. And more recently, I've been in touch with Elise again, doing a bit more research. Um, and my interest in research developed. And I think Sue and I were talking the other day, it's amazing. And you mentioned briefly that you look at a document and you think you've got everything from it, or you look for something and you think you've got everything from it. And then you look again and you find out more information. And only recently I've been in touch with a committee in Mauthausen about another relative of my grand's uh, from, from the other side. Um, so it might sound like it's sort of been plain sailing so far with my research that I've done, but there, there were many difficulties along the way as well. Um, my mum and my grand went to uh, Krakow in Poland to try and find out about some of her relatives uh, from her mother's side. And it was before um, Krakow joined the EU and it was much harder to get hold of documents. Not everything was uh, digitalized as much as it is now. Uh, my grand went frequently as a child as well. So she kind of knew Krakow and knew the area. Um, and once uh, Poland joined the EU, we then went as a family to try and find out some more information. And we went to look at a business that some family members had owned called Technopole. And we came across a woman who was there and we said Technopole. She said, yes, yes, yes. And it, it was almost like a penny fell out of the sky. The penny dropped. And when she realized why we were there, we just wanted to find out about it. She really shut down and that was the end of the conversation. So we came across many different experiences. Um, through the family research. So that was, uh, that took me up until about, I'd say the 15, 15 years or so ago. And then that would really bring me next to the Maimon side, which is how Sue and I have got in touch. So my grandma Lita Maimon, her father was one of five siblings. And one of the uh, children uh, was Kurt uh, Maimon, who Sue's already mentioned. And now he seemed to have known, he seems to have known all of the different relatives, but unfortunately, and we don't know why, um, he never managed to piece it all together or let everybody know. He, he did get um, ill at one point, so that, that, could be, that could be the reason. Now, so my gran was in touch with this uh, relative and she was in touch with a cousin called Mariana as well, uh, and Freddie and Renee who were in Canada. Now, it, it sounds like there, there's quite a lot of Maimons and that everyone was in touch, but everyone was so far away. It never really seemed uh, like such a big family that it, is, that it is now. It just didn't really seem like that. So um, during lockdown, I decided I would type up a bit more information. I started using a program called Ancestry um, and I did it on my laptop this time, not my uh, PC. And um, when I've looked back at the information I've put in there, I have got 465 people and 800 photos. So I think if someone would have told me at the beginning that that's what you would have ended up with, there is absolutely no way that I would have started. But um, here we are. So um, I, I typed up all and put all of the information in, and then I got a, a contact from uh, a woman called Judy who knew some of the cousins in 
Canada. And from there, there was a connection going on there. And then I was looking at different strands of the tree that hadn't been pieced together and we didn't know about. And I decided I wanted to find out about Liesl, Sue's mum. I now know it's Sue's mum. Uh, of course, at the time I didn't. Um, and we knew that um, she'd gone to Birmingham and we knew that she uh, was born in Vienna and that was it, nothing else. So I contacted uh, the Wiener Holocaust Library and I said, um, I have an elderly relative. Uh, I don't know if she's alive anymore. All I know is that she came over with the uh, kinder transport. Can you help? So they direct me, directed me to World Jewish Relief and I gave the name and they did some research for me and they got back to me and they sent me a photo. So um, I, had, I had one photo of uh, Liesl in a family album and I was comparing it with this photo that um, World Jewish Relief, has, Relief had uh, sent me. Now I don't know if uh, you've seen black and white photos but as far as I'm concerned most people in black and white photos all look the same anyway so it was, um, it was quite difficult to decipher but I thought I would just uh, have a go. So um, I carried on I contacted the AGR, the Association of Jewish Refugees, and they directed me to a database. Uh, the database had, I think, over 300 entries of uh, children who'd come over on the kinder transport. So I thought um, there's absolutely no way whatsoever that I'll be able to find anything out. But I persisted. I filtered the database quite a few times and I managed to find uh, the place of birth, which seemed to be a match date of birth seemed to be a match and Birmingham seemed to be a match. So I then wrote back and I said, entry 300 and something, is it Liesl, is it this person? And they wrote back and they said, yes, it's her, but unfortunately she's passed away. So I'm sure you can imagine at that point, I had a, a sinking feeling really. I'd come this far, I'd used a lockdown to try and do something positive and that was the reply I got. They said she was married, so you could try and search under her married name. So I thought, I'll give it a go. I'll see if I can find anything. To be honest, I wasn't really expecting to find anything at all. So I searched under uh, Liesl's married name and found uh, some information on an electoral register. And I picked a name that was there, which was Sue's name. And um, I, did a, a quick search on my phone. So there are some advantages to technology. And I uh, sent Sue a message as you've heard. And the reply I got back was, yes, Liesl was my mum and I nearly fell off my chair. And uh, uh, since, since then we've, uh, we've come across some other Mimans as well. We've WhatsApped. Um, and I say, I think the most amazing thing really is, is that we may well have brushed past each other in the street uh, and never have known. And here we are 80 years on, or over 80 years on, uh, having found each other. So um, it's quite, quite amazing, really. So that's how, that's how I got to um, the 15th of June. So, um, Sue and I would like to show you a bit more information we've put together. So I'm going to attempt to uh, share my screen uh, and I hope that you will be able to see uh, what we've got here just to uh, put things into context a little bit more. Uh, let's see if this works. Okay. Just... Is that Sue? Can you see that from your end? Everyone else? Can't hear you, Sue. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm back. Yeah. You, you yeah. can everyone see that? Yeah. 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 Great. Okay, so many, many years of research and uh, to put things into context a little bit more, this is, this is where we've got to so far. So um, at the top, I hope you can see my uh, cursor, you can see Gershon Maimon. So I suppose um, you could say it's his fault really that all of this started. He's, he's the one who's responsible. Um, and he was married to uh, Leah, uh, Kimmel or Kummel. And then there are the five siblings that we know of. Um, so uh, Leo, uh, Ignatz, Sally, David and Bernard. And there are two others as well that we are not really sure about yet, are we Sue? 
No, we don't. We're, we're not sure if they're related. Nobody seems to remember them, but there, there's some coincidences that they could possibly be related. But we're still looking into that. Um, and you can see, so the family started in Chortkov. Um, Sue and I spent a long time talking about Chortkov as well. Because <laughs> it, it used to be Ukraine, but apparently it's now Poland. And um, and we were wanted to kind of take you on the journey of how they got to Vienna. Uh, what we know. Um, we know that uh, Sally Myman was in Poland and um, she didn't manage to escape Poland. But we're going to really look at uh, David Myman, who would have been my great grandfather, and Leo Myman would have been my great grandfather. That's right, exactly, yeah. So, Sue, do you want to do you want to go? Yeah, so what we were able to find, um, this is a, a register of um, all Maimans in Vienna um, from, like you see, 1904. There's, there's actually four or five sheets of this, but we put the first one and the last one. Um, we don't know when they actually came to Vienna. We're assuming it was the end of the 1800s where the pogroms were happening, but my grandmother was actually born in Vienna in 1900. So they came around that time. Um, but you can see um, as the time goes on, they actually started up businesses. Um, so uh, Leon or Leo is my great grandfather. He had the poultry shop um, and Moritz, you can see, was an architect. So you can see over the years what they were all doing. Um, David was actually an architect as well. So that's where this is wrong. He wasn't an estate, a real estate developer. But anyway, if you go on to the next one, which is then going up to 1939, you can see um, that everybody is listed in 1938, but then in 1939 is only my great grandfather, um, because in 1938 the rest of the family fled to uh, Shanghai and, and the UK and so forth. It was only Leon or Leo that stayed um, in 1939 after Kristallnacht, um, and obviously he did. He was the only one of the the siblings who didn't uh, escape. He didn't get out. So, but it's quite interesting to see what they were all all doing. Um, at the time. John? Yeah. Do you want to stop? Yeah. No? Okay, and this is, um, like I was saying, that uh, I only knew, uh, or mum only knew about this side of the family. So this is where you can see Brindle Cherry. So uh, mum, I think, Joel, if you, yeah, Brindle Cherry, she said that was my great grandmother, mum's um, grandmother. I've known about her side of the family because that was the side of the family that, um, the, the distant cousin who'd come over as a domestic to the UK she knew about. See, what I never, and I don't know why, it's one of these things, why didn't we look into it, but I never even considered Leap or Leo's side of the family. I think you, it's, I don't know why, it just, this is what mum knew. Um, but of course, she was six years old, she wouldn't have even known that her grandfather had family. So we tried to look into the Liechtenstein family, so there was nothing there. Um, and so the Maimon, we hadn't considered it. So and this there, was all we knew and everybody had, uh, she just thought everybody had died. And there was quite a big age gap between um, your mum as well and my gran, wasn't there as well? Yeah. I think about 13. Yeah, that was the so. difference. See, my Leo was some 19 years older than, uh, than your great grandfather. So there was a big age gap, yeah. So, um, so here you can just see it a bit more clearly. So there we have Gershon once again. And you can see the uh, two of the siblings, so David and Leo, uh, brothers. And then if you go down, so my gran uh, Melita, my oma Melita was first cousins with Bella. And then we go down to the next line and there's Liesl, who uh, was actually on the same line as my mum. And then Sue and I, who are on the same line. I think we worked it out eventually, didn't Obviously we? Obviously the same age, hey Joel? Uh, uh, yes, yes. With the same yes. generation, hey Joel? Yes, exactly. Yes, yes, we are definitely. <laughs> um, and I think we worked out, didn't we, Sue, that we're fourth, fourth cousins. I think is that correct? We're fourth cousins, yeah. Yeah. So it gets a bit confusing, but that's that's the link. Um, and then we just thought this would be really interesting to see. So we spoke about the um, sib uh, the uh, siblings here and, and their their partners there. And then if you go to the next the next row down, you can see all of the cousins. So there's uh, Judith and Renee and Freddie. Melita, my grandmother, uh, Steffi, Greta, and uh, then we go on to uh, Toldi, Arthur, and Bella. Now, many of them um, went all over the world, as you can see, to Shanghai, Florida, Italy, Canada, 
Israel, England, but um, some of them didn't, did they, Sue? Sue, are you there? I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't hear that last bit. It froze on me. Oh yeah, I was saying that um, the relatives they went all around the world. Uh, they yeah. left, they fled, uh, but not not everyone did. So, right. and I think that's interesting to see that everybody everybody was registered up until 1938. Um, and if you if you go to the the next um, slide, I think the next. Can, can you go to the next one? Yeah. Okay, this is where this is where you can see um, at the bottom where Joel's. This is this is Kurt, who was the 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 pin or the link between everybody. Yeah. Um, you can see that's that's Joel's parents. Is that that's that's that, Rita. So that's my mum and her parents. So uh, my grandparents, Melita, and my grand's uh, mother uh, with uh, Kurt in England uh, there, and then. That's you in Israel, Sue, isn't it? When, yeah. when you mentioned previously. Yeah. And then, and then that's my grandparents with Kurt. So this is the relative who seemed to have known everybody and everything, but unfortunately, he just didn't tell everyone. And I think, and, and this is the one, you know, it's, of course, it's fantastic what, you know, what we've, that we're back in contact. And, and, I, and I have to say that it's, it's we, Joel and I have actually done a DNA test and it's official. We are, we are actually related. And, and that, having grown up, um, having no family to suddenly belong to something, it's um, it's amazing. It's just, but they're on the sad side, you know, Melita was literally a few kilometers away from where we were. She died a year before mum. So if mum had known that there was a family that was there, maybe her life would have been a lot easier. She would have, the survival guilt or the, the being alone um, and everything wouldn't have, you know, impacted her quite so much, but obviously you can't look back, but it is, it does have a little bit of a bittersweet side to it as well. Yeah, it's uh, some things yeah. we, we've talked a lot about this and some things we'll just never know the answers to, no. um, unfortunately. Um, but if we go, if we go back to the photos here, so you can see these are all of the uh, different uh, relatives as well. And I hope you can see my cursor on this one. So this is three of the brothers. Now, um, bear in mind, the black and white photo is probably well over a hundred years old, I would have thought. Mm -hmm. And um, I managed to find an app uh, where you can uh, change them into color. And I think it's quite incredible that you can actually see, I mean, see, see, uh, see it in color really, and uh, all the detail as well. Um, so, so we wanted to show you uh, to show you those. And down on the corner here, this is my gran uh, as a ballet dancer in Vienna, and some of the other cousins. And then up here, Sue. Yeah. This is, uh, your mum. Yeah. Yep. And underneath, it's uh, Bertold, the one that fled to France. Yeah. yeah. And this is actually the photo that I had uh, in in the album, of course, in black and white, and I got it uh, put into colour as well. So that's the one. Because photo... well, Kurt had also, um, Mum didn't have any photos of herself or the family. So all the photos that I have are actually photocopies that Kurt had sent Mum, mm. photos of when she was younger and of the family. So that's why we've got photos of the family because Kurt had them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then we go on to the not the yeah this one. This was an incredibly special photo. I think if you can see, um, these are, this is a, a Zoom call that Joel was amazingly managed to, uh, to organize with all the family, um, the people that could make it that, you know, in the US, uh, England, me over here. But I think the, the special thing is in the middle there next to me, you'll see Renee. Renee is the only uh, one of the, uh, the first generation still alive. And to me, um, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of, I talk about this very, as if it's very matter of fact, and um, because it's something that I've just always lived with. But for the first time, I have to say, I got emotional when I heard Renee, who actually um, knew my grandparents and actually mentioned that my grandparents were very lovely people and that she remembered my mother as a child in Vienna. And that, I think that really brought it home for me. And that's what made it so, so special to feel that we're actually now part of this, um, we're part of something bigger, we're part of a family. It is quite, it's quite amazing that so many years on that we managed to have a, a Zoom call. Um, uh, and I think, I think uh, Renee said as well that she never thought uh, ever that she would see uh, this many people in one family, in, in one room or one virtual room, one virtual room really. Yeah. So all those years on, that was quite, 
quite amazing to to be able to uh, to be able to achieve and to do, and I'm sure it will be one of uh, many more to to come. Um, the last thing we wanted to sorry, Sue, did you want to? Come on, come on. The the last thing we wanted to show you was this is a list of combined organisations that we have used uh, to carry out our research. I'm sure there are many other. In fact, I'm sure there are many other websites and uh, organisations that we have used, uh, but these these are really the main ones that we've used uh, the most, uh, which you can which you can see on the screen here. So I think it's now over to uh, Elise. Yes, yeah, so I'll stop sharing my screen. Has that stopped? Yeah. yeah. That's great. Thank you so much to Joel and Sue for taking the time to put all that information together and for sharing with us what a remarkable story um, and yeah just what a wealth of information that you found uh, and just to say to all of the participants we will uh, circulate a list of those institutions and resources which may prove useful in your own family research. Um, just in your conversation you both touched on so many of the themes and concerns that I know that Mary, Christine and I think about quite a lot when we're dealing with family research um, and such a real wealth of information. You've almost created your own archive there. I think, you know, the Vina, Vina Holocaust Library might be in trouble. <laughs> um, just thinking about our audience here tonight, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of them will be carrying out their own family research. They may also have hit dead ends. You know, there, there may not be as much information for, for everyone out there. Um, as you can able to find. And that's what got me thinking about this, the, the human cost of this research on the people who, who are doing it. And um, Sue, you mentioned sort of needing a break from everything after, after your mum had died, you know, and these tiny, tiny sort of details that one thread that you pull that just expands and it becomes a bigger and bigger and bigger, almost endless seeming quest for information. Um, and the bittersweet nature of a lot of the research that you mentioned as well, knowing there'll always be unanswered questions. Um, so I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. It seems a real need for resilience in the research um, and a real sort of tenacity. Um, and I was just wondering if you could sort of speak briefly to that, how, how you dealt with that. You must have had days when you just thought, oh, I, I can't do this, I give up. And how did you sort of work through that and um, continue? Yeah. Um, I think um, what I found is, I think one of the one of the things which has always pushed me, I'd always heard and and through research and seeing things and, and studying and that sort of thing that, you know, all, all of the records have been destroyed, everything has gone. Uh, and a lot, I, a lot has been destroyed, but there's a lot that hasn't. And for me, I, I couldn't accept that. You know, I thought the, I thought these people did exist. Um, they definitely existed and I'm going to do all I can to see if I can uh, put a face to the name uh, or find out what happened to them and it does it is hard I mean I've I've been doing this for 15 years or so and there's still there's still unanswered questions and I think you, you've also recently found some new information as well that I didn't have um, so I, I would say that uh, you need to take your time. Um, I'd say going through it systematically is probably a good way to start, but I've always found that, you know, I'll look at one, one side of something and then I'll get, I'll go off on a tangent somewhere else and then it will be hard to come back. And, um, and I think the more, the more you, the more you look over, over documents again and again, you always seem to find new information out from it. That might sound silly, but new new things always come out from a document i found no I, I think that's i think that's very um i don't think that sounds silly at all i think sometimes if you go into looking at a document with a specific question in mind it's very easy just to focus on on that and rather than looking at the document sort of in its um in its entirety and seeing what other information can be gleaned from that um yeah and i just i think i do think though it is worth reflecting on whether even if the research that you carry out looking for a relative even if it is unsuccessful even if there is ultimately no trace of a, of a person even the act of carrying out the research is in itself even if ultimately unsuccessful a, a, a form of commemoration and a way of keeping people in mind there are 
so many victims of the Holocaust for whom there is no trace, for whom there is no documentary trace of their persecution. Um, but the efforts to undertake that research to try and find them, I think, have a value um, in and of themselves. Um, but yes, and thinking as well about identity, I think, Sue, you were talking about, uh, well, both of you have mentioned lockdown as being a real sort of time for, for reflecting on this process. Mary, Christine and I, we've seen a real upsurge in uh, requests for information during lockdown. Anyone in the audience who's waiting to hear back from, from me or us, I apologise, please bear with us, please. <laughs> um, what do you think has caused that? This, do you think it's just been people have literally had the time to go through documents or to reflect? Or do you think there's like a broader issues of reflecting on who we are and what our identity is while we're all sort of sitting at home? Sue, so you're still muted. So. Oh. Yeah, um, I think that the thing for me that, like I said to you, I, I needed a break from it. I think one of the things that really um, I was so worried about was the fact that if I started looking, there was nobody for me to ask um, if it was right or if it was wrong. Um, silly things that when my, when, uh, before my mum died, we went through a lot of information. We went through a lot of the, her old documents because I knew there was nobody else to ask. And so when she did die, I thought, I'm not going to do this because there's too many questions that are going to come up and it would just drive me crazy. So that's why it took me so many years to actually, okay, now I'm going to do it. But now, even now I, I found another document that of the family that she was taken into uh, the Jewish family where she was taken into for a year, I found on a, one of her school reports, the name of that family. And it turns out that two, they had two other children who were also kinder transport children. So I'm now trying to trace them. So like I said, this, it's never ending and it really isn't. Even, but it's, it's, it's one of those things that you just, I think I've accepted that I'm not gonna know all the answers, but any little bits that actually will help but I think it's also once you get to a certain stage, I, I could stop now and it would be fine. I feel for, I've got, you know, we've got to a stage where the, the family tree is whole, it's healthy and it's great. Uh, anything else is just a bonus if we find anything else, really. Yeah, I, I, I'd, agree with, I'd agree with you, Sue, and, and what you said, I think definitely. I suppose the only shame is, is that, you know, I'm, the interest for me stemmed from my grandparents. I'm doing the research and I can't share it with them. Yeah. Because it's only so many years later that everything has become much more accessible. Uh, but that's a personal choice that I have to make whether I feel like it's something that I want to continue with, which I do. But so yeah, that's that's the one thing I'd say. I think my, my um, when I say, oh, I wish mum had known this or why didn't mum look into it more? And my husband always says to me, she couldn't. It wasn't she wasn't able mentally it was, apparently she'd had a post-traumatic episode and so everything was blocked so everything that she did know was only, the only things that she could cope with so I think even if I had come up with this and to be able to share it with her, I don't think she'd have been able to deal with it so I think that's also uh, with the yeah. trauma that she's gone through. I think I, I think you know I think it was all locked away in people's minds you know what what happened um so although my, my gran talked about many things, I think really those dark times were kind of locked away and only, you know, my gran talked to me about things, but she didn't really talk to my mum about things. So they say, don't they, that sometimes through generations as well. And that's why she talked to you, because my, uh, my mum talked to my children yeah. um, a lot more than she actually talked to me. My children did presentations about it and asked her and interviewed her and, and talked to her about it. And she wrote a book for them about her, her um, what she did remember and things that I didn't even know about. Maybe she was trying to protect me, but was able to tell her her grandchildren. Yeah. I think that is something we see at the library is that often the third generation, for some reason, can, um, not that they can engage more, more easily, but that it's a different relationship between the third, from the third generation's perspective from the second generation. And, and we see that um, play out quite frequently um, in, in our, in our uh, workplace. Um, I mean, family research at the best of times can be quite fraught when you add into the mix the fact that we're dealing with such a, a fraught history of persecution and pain and grief. It's just then it's an, another level of um, potential sort of distress um, and this potential unearthing uh, of information that, that you might not regret unearthing, but just might be difficult to deal with. So, yes, I, I can completely understand what you're saying there. 
to about your mum not necessarily being able to. I think people carrying out this this type of research need to be really gentle with themselves and with the people that they're that they're working for. If, if they still have a um, someone who experienced that they can speak to, it's, it's such a fraught thing to try and discuss. Um, can I just ask briefly, right, because we're coming up to 10 to 8, um, so if you've got any questions in the chat, uh, in from the audience, do pop them in the chat and we'll start feeding them in. Can I just speak to you briefly about the DNA test side of it? Because I think, I find that such a fascinating new development in family research. Um, from my perspective, I, I, from what I understand of it, it seems like a, it can be a valuable tool. Um, I would regard it as just sort of one more source of data along to be used alongside various other issues but obviously there's issues to do with who owns the information once you've submitted it to a company um the user agreements you're signing uh, you know when you went for the dna testing did you weigh these things up and would you is that a route you would recommend to people um i sorry Sue. um i don't I done it and i just said yeah i'll do it then <laughs> I mean, you, you, you do raise really, really uh, like quite a serious question about uh, rights and privacy and who owns it and those sorts of things. Um, I think for me, the reason I was curious to do it was uh, because having had family and quite a large proportion of my family who were born in another country and then had to flee and so many unanswered questions and uh that was the reason why i i wanted to do it and i thought it would be quite an unusual something unusual to do quite amazing i mean i have to say it matches you up with thousands and thousands of people so i i i couldn't i couldn't tell you whether we or i are actually related to them right at the bottom of the list but i mean at, at the top of the list yes that you can see that you are actually re related it's quite incredible really i think it's one of those things you you um, I, I saw something yesterday actually about how um, uh, it was on the television about how these DNA tests of people are taking them so seriously in terms of health. I don't think I would do that. I don't think I'd go into the health route of it. You can actually choose which side. And I just went into the ancestry side of it. Um, and from, yeah, for me, it was interesting because, you know, it shows where your family are from. And I can see that all the family, uh, my father was from, from Birmingham, from that side. So you can see that. And you can see that my mother was from Poland and Ukraine. And, and, you know, it's very interesting to see that side of it. And then, of course, the, the official that I am <laughs> part of Joel's family. I mean, that was, you know, yeah, it's one of those things you can, you can think too much about, you know, or maybe it wasn't. But, yeah, for me, it was worth it. But like I said, I wouldn't do the health side of it or, or that kind of it. It was just maybe the ancestry, more the ancestry. No, it's a fascinating uh, new area. Um, and, I, yeah, I just think it's something that we're going to, see the results of it for years to come. I think it's a really uh, fascinating arena of, of family research. So I'm, I'm interested to see how it plays out really. Yeah. Um, just as where one of the things that kept striking me as you were going through the presentations was how much information you found. And thinking again about our audience um, at the moment, do you, what would your top practical tips be? Either in terms of how you manage the information that you find, whether that be through um, like ancestry, um, or whether that be through which institutions to approach, how to sort of balance um, in all those different um, angles that you're taking at once. What, what would your practical tips be for family researchers? Um, we do, you, we use the ancestry site, didn't we? And I think that's the thing because on the ancestry site, you can put in the, um, all the documents. So what I've done, we've, we've got both trees. So Joel's done his tree and I've done mine and we've linked them. Um, but for example, on mine, I've got, uh, if I go to my uh, grandfather, for example, you're able to put in all the information that you have, but also in a gallery. So I put all the photographs of him in a gallery, but I've also put in, uh, for example, with Arison archives, had um, information about him from today's year stuff. So I've been able to put that in it as well with the link to that page. So I think using these, these um, sites, um, the family tree sites, um, for me, it was a, that, that's one, one of the reasons I wanted to do it, because if anything happened to me, uh, all this information that I've got in my head will all have gone. So literally all the documents, I've scanned them in um, and you can see exactly where I got that information from. So I think that's the easiest yeah. way. And like you said also earlier, what you said, Joel, about read things over and over again. Yeah, I, I would, I'd agree. I'd say definitely um, type it up, um, probably on a 
on a site where you can edit things and store things as well. Um, that's that's the top tip I'd say is type it up first of all and then you can see it in front of you don't do what I did for many years and have hundreds of pieces of paper flying around the room and falling out of books and going everywhere um, I'd say type it up uh, make a list of the relatives that you do want to find out about even if you even if you think you've got some information but there's still some unanswered questions if you feel able to dig to dig so you can get the answers to those questions and then approach organizations such as the Wiener Holocaust Library who can uh, assist you with that and do a, a more extensive uh, search. And do it with somebody as well, even if it's not a family member, you know, I, I think that's also, I mean, I remember sitting with an A3 sheet and writing down all the names and clipping and, and, and yeah. sticking and, and, and everything. But the difference it's made having, doing it with Joel and actually said, and, and you know, I'll app him, hey, you never guess what I just found out. But also with other, you know, with friends I used to do it or with, with my husband, you know, just to share it with somebody, just to be able to, um, to discuss it because otherwise it just takes over your life as well. It becomes all consuming. Yes, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> there are uh, societies that you can join as well. I know the Jewish uh, Genealog Genealogical Society of Great Britain, um, you know, is worth considering membership there. Uh, the Facebook group, which as you say, Sue, can just provide support in what can be a really difficult, uh, drawn out uh, and quite a tiring process. So it's sort of good to to share those anxieties and get practical tips as well. You know, you never know in a, in a forum discussing which archives to use that someone might point you in the direction of, of an institution you, you didn't know existed. And um, so I would agree with you there, Sue, that approaching, you know, get as many people involved as you can, basically, I think. Yeah. Um, are there any questions from the participants that are coming in or no, no? Oh, sorry, Mary, I've just seen your message to me. Um, so yes, I think now, because we did want to wrap up for eight-ish, and it does seem that we're sort of coming on to that point, um, is there anything finally that either that anyone would like to add um, to the conversation? Just thank you for uh, letting us uh, share our story. Uh, yeah, I suppose, yeah, thank you very much. No, absolutely not. Um, I, thank you. Thank, thank you to you and Sue for taking the time to put together your presentation and for speaking with us and for your patience while I will sort of work with you on this as best we can. Um, and thank you everyone as well. Stalking now. That, that's the problem. We'll just keep stalking you now with more information, more questions that we've got. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look forward to the email. Um, I, I just hope as well that everyone, thank you very much for attending this evening. As I said, we are going to circulate um, a list of, of resources for all attendees here. So if you're looking to sort of very practical tips on where to get started hopefully that would be useful as well um i hope it's been interesting i hope you've been sort of inspired by what can be found sometimes um and we are here if, if you uh are wanting research to be done into the uh into your family's experiences it's always worth getting in touch with us and the details for that will be available in the um information we're going to circulate as well uh so i think now thanks once again to Joel and Sue. Thanks, Christine and Mary, and thank you very much to everyone for coming. Good night, everyone. <laughs>